Okay, everyone. Uh, this is going to be my last presentation, unless I will we'll do your presentations as well. And it's nothing to do with visualizations, or limited to do with visualizations. I'm going to be talking about how to give a presentation, and it's a bit weird because this is always the most nerve-wracking kind of presentation to give. Because if you're giving a presentation on how to give a presentation, there's a lot at stake. In fact, I even have a mistake right there on the front. I'm going to notice everything I do wrong. Uh, this was given as a presentation uh, to grad students for uh, iTech 5001, which is the grad seminar class, before they started giving their presentations. Because I've seen a lot of terrible presentations. And finding a way to get people to stay on point, to give a clear, clearly communicate their ideas, clearly communicate what they're trying to do, is always a challenge. And so part of this was aimed at graduate students. And I've modified it for you guys just so we can go over what I'm expecting for your final presentations. So with that being said, I always like starting off with a big, bold claim at the very beginning. And normally I also aim for participation. That's not possible here, but I would like you to think about, read this, this quote, and think about what I'm talking about. I love, it, it does grab your attention. It is big, bold, it's, you know, colorful, it gets people thinking, maybe talking, maybe sputtering under the breath, because there's something also special about this quote. And part of the reason I have this quote in there is because I laughed out loud when I saw it at first. So, a lot of people are terrified of public speaking, so I went looking for a quote for that, found this, and went, oh yeah, that's a great quote. Because, A, people may not have ever said people fear public speaking more than death. It might be just complete, a complete and utter lie. It comes from, it's also in a Jerry Seinfeld routine, but I have no, I cannot find any evidence of anyone ever properly saying that. Number two, Dumbledore did not say that. Number three, Dumbledore is not an Empire Strikes Back. Number four, that's Gandalf the Grey from The Lord of the Rings, played by Ian, McC uh, Ian McKellen. Um, McKellen? Anyways. Um, but, but played by Gandalf, that's Gandalf the Grey. That's not Dumbledore. The thing is just full of lies. There's four lies on one slide. It's fantastic for that. Which brings me to my other point. These are opinions. Most of the time when I'm talking about visualizations, that's my opinion is based off of you know years and years and years of... Uh, training and, and looking at the research for long periods of time. These are my opinions about public speaking. I've been public speaking for a while, but that does not mean that it's infallible or exhaustive or complete. Take things I say with a grain of salt, much like this quote with a grain of salt, but I'm hoping it'll be useful for you in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so let's get moving. Uh, so here's how a general outline is going to work for all of our talks and what I'm going to be trying to do is give a talk about how to give a talk using the structure of giving a talk so I'm going to start very general and then I'm going to start getting more specific with uh, like getting particular points across uh, it's going to be slightly more specific but it's still fairly general then I'm going to go over a specific point how to give audiovisual information I'm going to break up the talk by Doing, I would have broken up the talk by giving some kind of wake-up exercise, but oftentimes it could be in your presentation, it could be your video. Something to break up the monotony. You'll notice I'm trying to do that constantly. I don't always succeed, but I try. Uh, then I'm going to do another specific point. Then I can do another specific point. But I'm always consciously aware of about, you got about 10 minutes of attention. You might get 20 minutes. I push for 20 minutes always, but you don't have much more than that. There's, and so this is about the length of your presentation, but you cannot expect people to be hyper-focused that entire time. More importantly, you also cannot expect them to know what you're talking about before you even start. And that was one of my tragic flaws, so we'll look at that in a second. And then we'll, you'll do a take-home lesson, because at the end of the day, no one's going to remember your presentation. I know, it's terrible. They'll remember your take-home lesson, they might remember a couple points of it, but they will not remember every word that you said. And therefore, your job is to figure out what the central point is, what your outline is, and go from there. Also, I'd also like to point out, 
I'm a cheapskate and I wanted to find a chalk outline and I had to just I just grabbed a free Getty image. If you want to just steal free images for your presentation, be my guest. We do not have the budget to be pay paying other people for their stock photos. So go for it. Okay. So here's what my central premise for you guys is. That is have a central premise. Your talk has a particular purpose. You were talking about your visualization and what you the task you were trying to accomplish was, right? Your visualization serves a particular purpose. It needs to be slap in the face obvious what it's trying to do. Your words, your by language, your slides, everything that you do is in service of that central premise. What are you trying to get across? What is your system for? Anything that is not serving that purpose you can strongly consider removing it. It has a central thesis and you never deviate from the central thesis. So things can move up and down, it can have some flow, it, you can seemingly go on a little tangent, you can try and add other supplemental information, but that central line, that central thesis is the thing that drives everything. It is the hypothesis in science, it is the central thesis of your argument, Every, every field has something like that. For a presentation, you need to have a clear understanding of what you're trying to get across. And you can have ups and downs, but it, you always take a step back. If you don't know why it's in there, does it help with the central thesis or the central premise, right? The thread that everything hangs off of. Okay, so here is what we would normally consider narrative structure. And we'll say sort of narrative, sort of narrative structure. So we have exposition, the initial setup, we have the rising action of the story, we have some kind of climax, and it goes back down again, and then we have some kind of resolution. I love pointing out the Lord of the Rings for this one because the Lord of the Rings, especially the Fellowship of the Ring, that thing there is huge. If you've ever read the book, I've read it to the book series, I've read it twice, the first 100 to 200 pages is just like and then Bilbo had a fork and that fork had four prongs and it, 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 like it just went on and on and on and then you get to like Helm's Deep and it's I think I literally counted it. it's like two to three pages for Helm's Deep it's a hundred pages of talking about forks and then like two to three pages for Helm's Deep it's not there there's a lot of exposition the resolution also takes a darn long time I mean he drops the ring off the, the eagles go to pick him up and, sorry to spoil it for anybody, uh, the eagles go to pick him up and there's, there's another hundred pages of just tying off all the loose ends. It goes on forever. The rise up and the fall down, you can have multiples of these rise up and falls down, fall downs, but essentially ring of fire right here, right? <laughs> just dropping the ring off, sorry, not ring of fire, the ring in the fire, dropping the ring off in a Mount Doom, right there. That is the climax, when everything sort of comes to a head, and then you start cleaning things off. All right. Well, that's fairly simple, and that's old school, right? Including sort of boring. What we really want is that, right? An introductory climax. Get people's attention. That's the newer way of doing a story. You watch a Bond movie, you get a little action sequence at the very beginning, getting people excited by Bond, and then the actual rest of the story. James Bond movies are great for this, right? You have some exposition, not much. Um, there's a lot of exposition with Q, and that introductory climax is right at the beginning. We have a rising up action where you're finding out that they have the new, who has the nuclear bombs, etc., etc. And at the very end, you know, he dismantles the bomb, and then everything else gets resolved fairly quickly. And then we have, you know, him making out with some chick in a raft or something like that, right? That that's pejorative I guess I should I shouldn't have said that but I in this case for a lot of this the the female characters are not exactly well well defined three dimensional and interesting human beings the way they should be okay so that would be traditional story narrative structure here is narrative structure for for a talk and it turns out Nancy Dorr you can actually look at her TED talk on this Ironically, not a great TED talk. Anyways, <laughs> for te her TED talk, she she examined great, um, great talks throughout history. Things like uh, Martin Luther King's "I Had a Dream" speech, 
and I can't remember the other ones that she's looking at, but they're, they were the big talks that you look at. You have some kind of exposition, some kind of initial warm up, and then what the current state of affairs is. Then you go to what could be the sort of ideal of what you're aiming for. And then you go back down what is currently happening. And then what could be. And then what go, what is. And then what could be. And then you keep on going up and down, up and down, up and down. This animation takes forever, it seems. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But this is sort of the better way of looking at it. Even when you're going back down, you're still building up that pressure. You're supposed to, like, you go up and then you ramp it down a little bit. And then you go up and then you ramp it down. But you're always building towards this final conclusion. You never fully release the pressure. You just sort of tamp down the rhetoric a tiny bit. Let them calm down. And then you build up what you ideally could be. And the great speeches, like the I Had a Dream speech, I have a dream, I have a dream, um, follows this particular narrative. It is not flat at all. There, There's ebbs and flows for it, because you cannot scream into a microphone for 20 minutes and have people still listen to you. It has to go up and down. You have to have some dynamics. Otherwise, people will not understand. All right. If you want an example, I just listened to that this morning. Have a listen. If you haven't seen this 2004 speech by, by Barack Obama, it's fantastic. It's 16 minutes long. It covers everything, including that narrative structure. There's a what could, what it should be, what we currently have, what it should be, what we could have. And it keeps building and building and building. It's, it's a really well-formatted speech. I didn't even notice the what when I walked away after when I saw this for the very first time I think live I wasn't you know I was absolutely enthralled and I mean, watched it again this morning and I realized he has all sorts of mistakes in that speech he's flubbing his words in all sorts of places compared to what he what how he was near the end of his presidency but that speech actually gave him the presidency essentially it was such a a, a such a well done speech that it just electrified the democratic base. It was quite amazing. So have a look at it. It's a wonderfully well-designed speech. And there's you can come up with almost any any great speech you can think of, you will see that narrative pattern. JFK's uh, inauguration speeches or FDR's inauguration speeches, all of these things all have that similar kind of pattern. Um, I like to point out, besides just the narrative pattern, one of my take-home lessons I want you to have is, so we have a central premise, and how you give a good speech. Okay, so we have this narrative pattern. I also want to point out, before you get grossed up by this next picture, uh, that you have to be yourself because you will not, you're not going to be Barack Obama. Barack Obama is not trying to be FDR, right? You have to be your own person because that is ultimately what people are wanting to see and listen to. Now, that being said, you want to be your own person, but, so be yourself, but just your better self. So I'm going to move on from this, but if you don't know who this is, this is Eddie Van Halen, one of the most famous guitarists on the planet, uh, the, the main driving force behind the band Van Halen, huge per, you know, huge name in rock music, except chronic alcoholism, chain smoking, and a horrible just behavior attitude made him look like a crazy cat lady, but, you know, at the, well, I guess the early 2000s, right? He just looked horrible. And they brought him to, eventually when they found out they looked like a crazy cat lady, they brought him to the dentist, had him clean up his act. But he, this is not the real, no, this is not the real Eddie Van Halen. I don't even want to touch his teeth here. Uh, this is a better version of Eddie Van Halen. He's even way older than he was before, but he looks far better. You're putting on your, you're still yourself. It's just your best self. Do not look like you're, you know, dilapidated Eddie Van Halen, please. Okay, you can't fake your identity. Don't try and do TV evangelist, you know, big, bold claims or anything like that. You're playing to who you are. You try and compensate for your weaknesses that you know you everyone has, and you play to your strengths. So I'm not going to try and be, you know, um, overly serious and exactly on time. I know I have sort of meander a little bit, but I'm going to play to my strengths. I'm very passionate. I'm very loud normally, not on a microphone. I'm sort of playful, right? Play up to it. I'm not going to give a serious speech. It's not who I am. And ultimately, it is your passion. It is your 
who you are that actually sort of emboldens your speech. It gets people passionate about think something, right? It's your, your passion that drives people's attention. Even if you are quiet about it, you are still trying to say why this is important. Emotions drive the response. It's not the facts. The facts don't actually... The Barack Obama speech is not about facts. It's about getting an emotional response and getting people to call... It's a call to action. There's some facts in there, but it's really about getting that emo, that visceral reaction from people to get them to take action. And the only way to get it your own, to make it your own, is to practice and practice and practice. Uh, and it, that ultimately it will, will become your own, but you do need to practice, and it also means that you're going to be on time. right? You can't just sort of improvise most of your speeches. You do say it out loud. You try it out a couple of times. My suggestion to you would be try your talk let's estimate four times right take your if it's only a 20 minute talk you're doing like five minutes each person let's say do it four times 20 minutes of your time and assume that you're going to throw away, throw away three of them and then take your best one even if you need to do it a fifth time okay but if you think you're going to get it the first take eh, that's not necessarily that realistic so here are three researchers at northeastern they are radically different. They're all I, people I've really looked up to when I was at Northeastern. But despite, they had completely different characters. So, Kevin Gold on the side here. This is Kevin Gold. He is extremely quiet, extremely nerdy, has Squirrel Girl cartoons going into his lecture, and he's just, you know, he's, he's extremely organized and just, and quiet. He loves being a nerd, and he's fantastic. The students love him. He is not like me in the least in terms of how he presents, how he talks, how he's, he still makes jokes, but he's not, he, he's, he, he never claims to ever be cool or anything, but he's mesmerizing to watch. Amit Shesh is very similar to me. He actually didn't want to talk when he was an undergraduate, sat in the back of the class. And so he came up, he's, you know, he's a great public speaker, but one of my favorite examples as a lecturer was him talking about 3D and focus, because he, he does graphics. And he said, you know, put your thumb in front of you. Now look at the projector while looking at your thumb. And getting people to realize that you cannot focus on two things at once. Simple little things you can add to a classroom that make a huge difference. Again, not like in, in the other two. This is Ben Hescott. He's the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Affairs. He was working at Tufts. Just students absolutely adore him. He is the better version of me, I guess, if you will. He's all energy, all passion. He's very boisterous and loud and he's you know he he loves his work and you know he can he's what I would strive to if as a lecturer what I want to sort of get to right it's all about just getting people excited about what the topic that you're talking about I also have to be a lot smarter to be up to his level because he's a really really smart guy but right they're all radically different people not they're not all boisterous and loud they're not all chatty Two, uh, two of the three of them are extreme introverts. Only Ben is an extroverted person here, right? They all come from radically different backgrounds. They all dress differently. They all act differently. They are who they are, ramped up for presenting in public. You should be your best self, ramped up for presenting in public. All right. I also like to point out, here's subtle point number two. Uh, your presentation, no one's going to remember half of it, right? You cannot just push data on people. You can't drink from the fire hose. People won't retain everything. You can't any you can put everything on the slide, but people aren't going to remember it. They're not going to take anything away from it. It's just you cannot drink from a fire hose. And so this is just the start. You are selling what you're doing. You're not trying to present all of your data, your all of your information. I've seen some horrible this is the big gotcha you know thing that people do in presentations especially student presentations they try and put all of their text on this you know everything they want to say on the slide they try and show every last little bit of data they try and show everything and you can't absorb it so the image is what you're going to take away from this not anything I just said you can't drink from the fire hose don't try your job is to get them interested enough that they will actually want to look into your work more. That's always what the goal is. If they think it's useful, they'll look it up. They will not memorize what you just said. Okay.
or you have to focus on what the clear points that you need to take away is. Speaking of which, here's bad media. So, what not to do? Notice some of the problems we have. We have two different textures on the background. The texture is actually distracting. The color is actually almost isoluminate to the background, so it makes it extremely difficult to see things. And the fact that you have this texture on the background means that pattern recognition is actually really difficult as a result. And we could talk about all of those things from, from this class. On top of that, animated transitions for no apparent reason. Not, a, not very nice. Yes, this is from uh, the movie UHF, where he says, hey, Jimmy, do you want to drink from the fire hose? Open wide. Yeah. Yeah. And none of you are listening to a damn word I'm saying right now. Because an animated transition, if it's not, being, if it's not in service, I have to turn that off. An animated transition, if it's not in service of the lecture, people will stop paying attention to what you're saying. They will get, you know, they will fall for or be distracted by the most engaging thing in your presentation. So your job is to strip it down to your critical path. What are you trying to get across? Is your presentation in service of that? Again, being your best self, being and, and focusing on the presentation and what you're trying to convey. I don't want to see raw lines of code, especially you explaining pages upon pages of code. I've seen that before in presentations. That is a kiss of death as well. Do not give me a wall of text. So I'm going to have to actually turn this off for a second. For, so hold on a second. OK. Do I actually have it here? No, actually, I didn't actually put the, the notes on there. I thought I had it. Let's put it back on. So I thought I had extra notes that I wanted to tell you. But I want to just explain why you don't put a wall of text on there. I will say that pretty much 90% of you probably right now are not listening to a darn word that I say. Unless I actually say your name like, um, you know, Eddie, I'm hoping you're actually paying attention to this. <laughs> or Laura, same thing. Uh, if I say your name, you'll probably pay attention and, and actually listen to the words that I'm saying. But the vast majority of time, if there's text on the screen, you're not listening to what I'm saying. That's why you have to remove it. Because although you might want to say all of those things, it's not going to really help you. It's, I'm actually realizing that the next slide is where oh, my other no is. And I'm hoping some of you have, would have put up your hands by now. Nobody, you, they can't do two things at once. Your slides and your words are in service of your main central premise. And if you put a wall of text, no one's listening to the words that you're saying. That's the point of this slide. Also, this is where I wanted to do the notes. Here I am reading my slide notes. Notice that the tone of my voice changes. Sure, I don't stammer, and in some cases, speaking with notes, without notes can be worse. However, if you practice enough, and since this is a video, you want your language to be natural and fluid. Right. That's the other point. A lot of people will have notes. You have to get off your notes. It's a safety blanket, but it also means that you don't, you're not speaking naturally, right? Ums and ahs are not the end of the world. Now, if you need some notes, if English is not your uh, not your first language, if you stammer to a lot, if you really are terrified of public speaking, fine, have notes, but practice the crap out of them. Practice them over and over and over again until they're second nature, because if you read your notes, it will sound terrible. Okay. You also have to know your audience. So, what do they know? What do they want to learn? What do they already know? Like, uh, are they even paying attention to you? If you're watching videos or soccer videos, uh, then you're probably not paying attention. Can people take a joke? How much of a joke can they take? Are they? What are they trying to get across? Depending on the environment, I have to change what, how I present things. One of the key takeaways uh, for getting to know your audience is if you know your audience, you can give them examples that relate to them, which is what I keep on trying with when it comes to your projects. So when I talk about shredding reds, suddenly the shredding reds team pick their ears perk up and they start listening to what I'm saying. Knowing what they're trying to get across, if you were doing a similar project to another group, point out that, that other groups are more likely to pay attention now. right? Individual names, individual things that people actually care about, talking about something that they can all relate to about see you learn sucking or whatever the case is gets your foot in the door if you know what they know and you know what they're trying to get across 
it's a lot easier to corral them into your to your central premise. And if you if you're telling a joke, you better make sure that they can actually take a joke and you're telling it well, because a clown at a funeral is not what you want to be, right? If it's something somber and you're and you're trying to be very serious and then you're making jokes and the other person's making jokes, it's not quite the same. If it's all jokes and even if it's meant to be jokey and it's all jokes, it's also not the same, right? It's there's a fine line. All right. So normally this is where I'd have a 20 minute wake up call. In fact, you can even take a pause in the video, go off, do something else, come back, right? Normally I'd do something to break up the concept. This would be a good place where you'd put your videos, for example, or a good place to point, to change your topics or to ask for, to, to get some participation in the group. So oftentimes I, you'll notice that I will give a presentation, I'll be giving my presentation and at about the 10, 20 minute mark, I'll start opening the floor, to, I'll ask a question, and I'll wait for responses from you guys just to sort of break up the monotony. I know it can be monotonous. So you want some interesting concepts. So for my grad class, for example, I did this. I got people to tell them either name, their hometown, and something interesting about themselves. Just something to get them out of the sort of settling in and letting the, the, the presentation wash over them, getting them actively engaged. If you are presenting, the words coming out of your mouth are important, somewhat obviously. So people have a tendency, especially introverts, have a tendency of trying to talk really quietly and it's very hard to actually understand what they're saying and uh, maybe there might also be reading stuff as well. If you are presenting, people want to hear you speak clearly, confidently, loudly, not too loudly, not like me, but you are, you have stage. so ums and ahs. In fact, you don't need to go fast. You can take your sweet time. Because if you um and ah, people, what's the point of an um and an ah? It's actually a placeholder in a conversation. When you're talking with somebody and you um at the end, it is to say, I'm still not done with my thought or with what I was trying to say. Don't interrupt me. You're, you're staking your claim until you can finish your next sentence. Now, if you're not used to public speaking, I strongly recommend giving this a try. It's a weird thing to have happen. If I talk in a weird way and put random pauses in my sentences, no one will interrupt me. Now this is a video. I wouldn't expect you to interrupt me. That's actually a challenge. But if I did that live in front of you, and I have done this countless times, no one still interrupts me. It is a weird phenomenon. If you're used to having to stake your claim in a conversation, when you're public speaking, no one's going to interrupt you. That's something to get used to because ums and ahs are you trying to make sure that people don't step in on you. You don't have that problem here. You can take your time. You can relax. You can go slow. You don't have to speed through things. One of my other one of my other mentors at Northeastern pointed out that the first time presenting is never your first time. Anyone that's giving a practice presentation has practiced it or should have practiced it multiple times beforehand. So it should never be you trying to find the words or anything like that. It should be fairly well, uh, a fairly well trodden path. So you want to practice it until you're comfortable. You don't want it overly scripted, but it's not random. It's just that right amount of random. Right? Just enough to make off comments, offhand comments, to, to adapt to the room that you're talking to, to know your audience, to make a little joke if one comes to mind, to go through an example, to, to adapt based off of what students have asked you, but not enough that you are uh, sort of improvising the whole thing. Right? It is, you are, have a central premise that you're trying to solve, uh, sort out, a central premise that you're trying to establish with your audience and just enough improv to make it interesting. That's what the difference between a video and a live demonstration is. Okay, by language. On top of that, which we don't have to worry about here, but just just to point out, what you're doing on the, in front of people actually makes a difference. So here's George W. Bush, here's Barack Obama. You can clearly indicate what they're trying to show. You can clearly indicate what he's trying to show. The body language tells a lot, even if you don't mean it to.
it conveys a lot of the message that you're trying to that you're trying to say and so being consciously aware of what you're doing with that with your body is a critical component you want to avoid distractions like pacing back and forth if you don't have to can be distracting uh, it can incur movement can encourage people but it can also really distract things uh, and I find I find it really fascinating you have people talking really quietly and then you have people hiding behind the podium hoping people won't notice them they sort of just sort of tuck away and try to you know turn invisible no no you're presenting you have the stage it's your time so even if it's terrifying if you're jumping out of the frame out of a plane are you afraid of being naked right in both cases those are both circles of hell for me i much rather public speak than any of the either being naked in front in public or jumping out of a plane but the point is really scary things if you're doing it you might as well do it right you're presenting that's fine all right so here are here is a couple of ted talks in case you didn't believe me when i'm saying all of these things there are actually lots of you know how to give a public speak you think this is just one snippet like uh, don't read your talk for example right from the ted uh, ted talks 10 commandments michelle borkins also had a bunch of presentation tips some of which back uh, match up with mine so practice 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 watch lots of talks of good role models watch a bunch of ted talks it's amazing what they do take a breath take your time it's okay i <laughs> her comment is never apologize i <clears throat> yeah I don't follow that one very often, let's say. Uh, you always want your clear message and you want your aha moment at the end and you gotta know your audience. Okay, so we've already talked about the present, how to give a good presentation. What you guys are gonna be doing, uh, actually I gotta fix this. I fixed everything else, I fixed the actual original presentation, I did not fix this one yet. 20, all right, 20 minute talk maximum, about five, oh, you know, same amount of uh, talking per person for every single person on the team. These are big teams, hence 20 minutes. Also smaller number of teams than I'm used to. You want you have to have a two minute vid uh, video demo. That video demo does not have to be played during your talk, but you can point to playing the when you would play the a video demo. And it could be the talk, the video itself can be broken into, or your presentation can be broken into multiple different videos. Why? Because if you're not supposed to be right next to each other, it's kind of hard to make one unified video. Um, and what you're trying to get across is what's the point of your of your system? What's the problem you're solving? What's your design process? How did you, how did your system actually solve the problem that you originally set out to it, for it to solve? Right? You you have 20 minutes to explain to people why you've accomplished what you did. That's the point of this talk. The talk itself will be you recording your videos. You'll be making a post on Piazza for your videos and everyone will watch your videos and and ask questions so I'm expecting about at least three questions per video uh, or f per presentation and if you guys don't ask questions I will and it makes it a lot easier if you ask questions the, your questions are going to be a lot easier than the nasty things I'm going to give you so do your, do your classmates a favor by asking them questions okay people have a really short-term memory this is what you might take away for any given talk and what you should be worried about for your presentation next week. Because they have such a short-term memory, you need a central premise. You need one takeaway, the thing that they can walk away with and go like, I know what that's for. So any given talk is based around the central premise. It involves preparation, knowing your audience, speaking effectively and using your body language and slides correctly, and being your best self. And if you l wrap up all of those things, and it's in service of your central premise, then you're going to have a great talk. You really want to leave the audience with a single message in their mind. And ideally, I like putting a little bit of contact information so that they can ask you questions later because they can't take it all at once. But ultimately, great talks are about what you're trying to convey, not necessarily about the information on your slides. All right. So with that, that's how I'd normally leave my talk. See, and you can leave it off with questions and the contact information. Here's my central premise. Here are the different parts I was talking about. Okay, we've already talked about presentation guidelines, so let's, uh, there you go. This is what I was gonna say about the presentation. I have duplicated slide. So again, uh, we've already talked about this, but your, your 
talk you're going to be giving or you're going to be recording, it's going to be 20 minutes to uh, at maximum 20 minutes. You can be well below that, but you want to convey all the parts of that you did in your presentation. You know all the parts of your project. It should be essentially a standalone item as well. There'll be a two-minute video that you need to have already prepared and provide a link to that as well. Um, and you want to be you want to give the overview and then focus down on what the various parts of your project were, including some of your design sketches and how you got to the final conclude the final design that you have. If you want more resources on how to give talks, these are all great talks. Michelle Borkin's talk that made me a little nervous when I saw that how good that talk was. I love that talk. Uh, it's a it's a local TED talk that she gave, but can astronomers help doctors? Like weird things that we have for visualization community. Derek uh, Sivers, uh, weird or just different is fascinating funny video really quite short well worth to see or oh, actually this is we're just different yes Japan versus in uh, an American differences of culture how to tie your shoes and Hans Rosling's you've already seen that but uh, and oh we already did this I will also like to point out just for, to final uh, to finalize things why should you trust most of Michelle's tips well she gave a TED talk and none of us have so with that being said, uh, there are a lot of people that have given great talks. Have a look at some great talks. See if you find something that you want to make sure you incorporate. See how they go about presenting their information. See how they relax on the stage. See how they're trying to convey their story. See if their message and their talk actually matches what I was talking about. That can be your little mini exercise uh, before your presentation. And then from there, practice your presentation record it, and then post it on Piazza on the, the slide I'm going to give you. All right. Thanks, everyone, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with for your presentations. Thanks.